بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على عبده ورسوله وخليله وصفوته من خلقه نبينا وإمامنا وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سلك سبيله واهتدى بهداه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We're continuing with the nullifiers of wudu in the author said when nawaqid of the taharat al-sughra thamaniya There's eight nullifiers of wudu The first one is al-kharij min al-sabilayn Anything exiting from the two private parts. That's the first nullifier of wudu. The second nullifier of wudu is walfahishu min ghayrihima. What exits from other than the private parts, that's repulsive. The third one is wazawalu al-aqli bi ghayri nawmin yasirin jalisan aw qaima. The author said loss of consciousness nullifies wudu and similar to it ruling wise is sleep. With the exception of light sleep while a person is standing or sitting. We mentioned the summarized overall brief ruling on this matter for the layman, and then we mentioned the detailed dispute for Tullab al-Ilm because it's a very common widespread matter. The fourth nullifier of wudu that the author mentions is wamassu al-farj, touching the private parts. And today, it's only focused on a male touching his penis. This mas'ala can be broken down and summarized into five opinions. Two of them are the obvious two. Touching the private part does not nullify the wudu. Then the next one is touching the private part nullifies the wudu. And I'll include within that the Shafi'i's opinion. It's the same opinion except they stipulated with the palm only. That can be made a separate opinion or it can be included under that and I'll include it under that opinion, inshallah. Then there's three more remaining opinions that attempted to consolidate between what appears to be conflicting a hadith on this matter. And that's the opinion that it's touching with desire or that it's touching it purposely or that it's mustahab and not a wajib to make wudu. For a total of five opinions. So let's start with the first opinion. The first opinion is that touching the private part does not nullify the wudu at all, unconditionally. And that's the opinion of the Hanafiya and Malikiya. Some of the Sahaba that chose this is Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and Ibn Abbas, and Ammar ibn Yasir, among others. And some of the Tabi'een that it's attributed to is Ibn al Bundir and Rabi'ah and Sufyan al Thawri. Their proof centers around the hadith that we'll refer to as hadith Talq ibn Ali al-Hanafi or hadith Talq or hadith his son, hadith Qais ibn Talq. And it's a hadith that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa was asked about a man touching his private part and whether it invalidates wudu and he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا إنما هو بضعة منك or هل هو إلا بضعة منه or لَيْسَ فِيهِ وُضُوء إِنَّمَا هُوَ مِنْكْ The Messenger وسلم, was asked about a person who touched his private part. He said it doesn't require wudu because it's بَضْعَةٌ مِنْكْ It's part of your body, a normal part of your body. Meaning, it's like your leg and hand. You don't make wudu from that, so you don't have to make wudu from touching your private part. That hadith is considered weak by a Shafi'i and Ibn al-Jawzi and Abu Hatim and al-Bayhaqi and al-Daraqutni and Abu Zura, among others. And this opinion also used other weak narrations. They also argued and they said that the origin when one performs his tahara is that his tahara is established and remains intact. And it doesn't become nullified unless there's clear proof of a nullifier, not just some doubts. And here there is no proof of a nullifier, meaning pertaining to touching the private part. They also use the rationale from a discussion or a mini debate on this matter between Sufyan and Ibn Juraj rahimahumullah. Sufyan said there's no wudu for one who touches his private part. He doesn't have to make wudu. Ibn Juraj said he must make wudu. Sufyan asked Ibn Juraj, he said if someone has semen, many, on his hand. What does he have to do? Ibn Juraj said he just has to wash his hand. Sufyan said, what's worse or bigger? Semen on the hand or touching the private part? Ibn Juraj said, that's from the shaitan. 
what Sufyan, the argument that this opinion is using, is what Sufyan mentioned. What Sufyan is saying, rahimahullah ta'ala, is that he was performing qiyas, analogy, by saying if one doesn't need to make wudu from semen on the hand, which is mightier, then he doesn't need to make wudu from merely touching the private part, which is less. Al-Bayhaqi commenting on this said, what Ibn Juraj meant when he said that's from the shaitan, is that the rationale, the qiyas, or the analogy Sufyan used in this matter, while there's proof on this matter, is from the shaitan. Meaning, you don't resort to qiyas when there's proof. Another argument that this opinion made is that touching the private part is something very common, very widespread. It happens frequently. It cannot be accepted through a hadith, al-ahad. It must be through a hadith, mutawatira. This goes back to a much broader issue, and it's the issue of whether we accept a hadith, al-ahad, on such matters. And the hadith, al-ahad, is a hadith that reached us from one or a few narrators. Meaning, it reached us through a small number of narrators, a small number that's not enough to make it impossible for the narrators to have conspired in a lie. You understand that better when I tell you the opposite of that, which is the hadith al-mutawatir. The hadith that's considered hadith al-mutawatir is a hadith that is reported by a large number of narrators to a point it wouldn't be expected that they could have conspired and got together and agreed to make a lie. They said this matter of touching the private part is so common, widespread, it can be established through a hadith ahad. It has to be established through a hadith that are mutawatir. And here you're trying to establish it through a hadith that are ahad. Like I said, this goes back to a much broader issue that's discussed in usul on whether uh, we use a hadith, a hadith in such matters. And the simple answer, the basic short summarized answer is that a hadith, al ahad, that are authentic are used in matters like this and even in bigger matters than this. One of the most popular a hadith that are considered a hadith, a had is hadith that we all know and we all memorize. Innam al bin Deeds are judged according to the intentions. Each stage of the chain of narrators in hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ From Umar ibn al-Khattab on, down, all the way down, is a hadith, is, is, is classified as a had. And bigger than that is that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent individual sahaba to convey the deen of Allah. He sent them through writing or other means. And it was enough proof to be a hujjah upon the people they conveyed to. Dividing the hadith into a had and mutawatir wasn't known by the very early imams of hadith. If the a hadith that were transmitted by individuals or are labeled as a had by a small number of individuals uh, and they're labeled as a had, if they can't be used as proof, why would the Messenger وسلم, send individuals like Mu'ad ibn Jabal and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhum to convey the deen of Allah? And they weren't going to teach and convey a hadith or two, but the entire deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ It's not for the believers to go all fight at the battle all at once. From every division of them, a group shall stay back to gain knowledge and understand the deen of Allah and then go teach and warn their people when they return to them. That verse is referring to individuals. Ta'ifa, a small number of people conveying Islam. That falls under what they claim is ahad. It's a small number conveying Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have encouraged something that would be fruitless and a waste of time and effort by saying, let a small group learn and then convey Islam. 
Allah ordered and encouraged a group to obtain knowledge and warn their people when they return to them. It's used as the term used is ta'ifa. And that would fall under what they define as ahad. Another argument this opinion made is some of the, uh, those who adopted this opinion uh, of not re requiring wudu from touching the private part. One of the arguments is they said we can take the hadith that requires wudu from touching the private part, which we'll mention inshallah in the next opinion, and we'll take it with the hadith of Talq ibn Ali that doesn't require wudu. And we'll consolidate between them by stating that the meaning of wudu is just washing the hands. With that, you can consolidate between what appears to be conflicting hadith on this matter. The answer to that is that you cannot divert the ibadah meaning of wudu in the hadith to washing hands only without clear, authentic proof that indicates so. The clear ibadah meaning of the term wudu should be the ibadah of wudu that we know unless there's something clear, authentic that diverts it. And here there's nothing to divert the meaning of wudu from the ibadah definition to just merely washing hands. Hadith Talq ibn Ali al-Hanafi or Hadith Qais as we mentioned, the hadith that they're attempting to use to consolidate between the hadith isn't even authentic. You don't resort, and you hear this over and over, you don't resort to consolidating between the meanings of what appears to be conflicting a hadith unless they're both authentic. And here hadith Qais is not authentic. That's the first opinion that wudu is not required from touching the private part. The second opinion, the opposite of this opinion, and that touching the private part nullifies wudu. That's the opinion of Malikiya and Hanabila and Shafi'iyya, but Shafi'iyya stipulated that it's touching with the internal part of the hand only, meaning with the palm only. And since it's very close with this opinion, I included it within it rather than making the Shafi'iyya a separate independent opinion by itself. Some of the Sahaba who adopted this is Umar ibn Khattab and his son and Abu Huraira, and it's attributed to Aisha and Jabir, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhum. Some of the tabi'een and ulama is Ata and Tawus and Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib and Ikrima and of course ibn Juraj. The proof that they used is Hadith Busra bin Safwan. Hadith Busra bin Safwan in Muwatta Malik that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man massa dhakarahu fala yusalli hatta yatawadda. Whoever touches his private part should not perform salah until he makes wudu. Yahya bin Ma'in and Ahmed bin Hanbal and Al Bukhari stated in one way or another that this is the most authentic hadith on the issue of touching the private parts. Al Darami and others authenticated it. There's various narrations of the hadith with similar meanings. In response to those who distinguish between touching with the external part of the hand and the palm, which is the Shafi'iya or some of the Shafi'iya, Ibn Hajar responded to them and he said, actually he quoted Ibn Hazm. He said, Ibn Hajar said, Ibn Hazm said, it includes both the external and palm of the hand, and there's no difference between them. Then Ibn Hajar supported it by mentioning or referencing the verse, وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقَةُ فَاقْطَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا The verse on cutting the hand when someone steals. It refers to the entire hand. When you say hand, it's the entire hand because the hand is cut from the wrist. The hand is cut from the wrist. That's the entire hand. So anything of that touching the private part nullifies wudu. Then we have three more opinions. The third opinion is that touching the private part nullifies wudu if he touches it with desire. 
This was an attempt to consolidate between proofs that appear to be conflicted. They said we can combine between the hadith that order will do from touching the private part and the ones that say you don't need to make wudu by saying it's when one touches it with desire. This is the opinion of some of the Malikiyah. They said without touching the private part in desire, it's like any other body part. And they used the hadith that we took, إِنَّمَا هُوَ بَضْعَةٌ مِنْكَ It's like any part. So long as it's not with desire, it's like touching any part of your body. They said what distinguishes it from other parts is touching it with desire. Because it may be a cause for discharge. It's something that's similar to what we mentioned when we talked about sleep. It's not nullifier in of itself, but because it may be a cause for the discharge of wind without one knowing it. Here they said, touching is not a nullifier in of itself, but rather because touching in desire may cause discharge, which may nullify will do without one knowing it. Just like sleep and the discharge of wind. They also added that hadith, إِنَّمَا هُوَ بَضْعَةٌ مِنْكْ In the first opinion, they said that hadith was in the context of a person being in salah. And they said when one is in salah, he's far from touching his private part in desire because he's occupied in ibadah and in dhikr and focused on his salah. The answer to all that is that first of all, hadith talq is a weak, a weak hadith, as we mentioned. Number two, even if it wasn't weak, add in the stipulation of desire to touch in the private part in nullifying wudu is not backed by proof because even hadith talq, إِنَّمَا هُوَ بَضْعَةٌ مِنْكَ It doesn't mention the stipulation of touching with desire. Nor is that even mentioned in hadith busra. That's the third opinion. The fourth opinion is that if one touches his private part purposely, it nullifies wudu. Otherwise, it doesn't. And this is another opinion within the Malikiya Madhab, and it's chosen, chosen by Ibn Abdul Bar. They use the proof, وَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ فِي مَا أَخْطَأْتُمْ بِهِ وَلَكِمْ مَا تَعَمَّدَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ There's no sin or fault on you if you make a mistake, except if your heart deliberately, deliberately intends to do so. They said the verse shows that forgetting or mistake doesn't nullify wudu. The response to that is what Ibn Qudama and Al Awza'i said. They said the hadith that state touching the private part nullifies wudu are broad and they don't mention purposely or mistakenly. Number two, the way we respond to them is. وَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ The verse they use, there's no sin upon you. There's no sin upon you. No sin doesn't mean that the tahara does not get nullified. Those are two completely different issues. You don't get sins, that's one thing. But it doesn't mean that the tahara does not get nullified. A third way to respond to this opinion is, you don't distinguish between purposely or unintentionally in this matter. If you say purposely touching the private part nullifies wudu, while accidentally does it, then why don't you say the same about all the other nullifiers of wudu? Like one who discharges wind or urinates. Why not add the stipulation of purposely urinating or discharging wind and unintentionally doing so? The argument is inconsistent when you apply it to only touching the private part, but not other nullifiers of wudu. The fifth opinion, the final opinion, is that it's mustahab to make wudu from touching the private part. It's not a must, but it's a mustahab. This opinion is inferred from an opinion of the Malikiyah that states, 
that one who touches, it's inferred from that, that one who touches his private part must make wudu if he didn't make the salah yet. They said, if he made the salah, he should repeat the salah so long as the timing of the salah didn't lapse. Then they said, if the time of the salah lapsed in the past, there's no need to repeat the salah. Based on that, some ulama extracted or inferred from that, that this opinion is basically saying that wudu from touching the private part is mustahab, it's sunnah, it's not a nullifier, it's not wajib to make wudu. Why did they infer from that? Because they said if it was wajib, they would make him repeat the salah whether the timing passed or not. The, the, the fact that they only say repeat it so long as the time of the salah didn't lapse implies they think it's mustahab or sunnah to do wudu, not a requirement. This, like I said, is the opinion of some of the Malikiyah. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala also chose that wudu from touching the private part is only mustahab. Their proof for saying it's mustahab is an attempt to consolidate between a hadith requiring wudu from touching the private part and those not requiring wudu by just saying the way out of it is saying it's mustahab. The response is Resorting to consolidating between proofs that appear to be contradicting is only when they're authentic, not when one of them is weak. When a hadith is authentic and another is weak, you don't resort to consolidating between them. Rather, you go by the authentic hadith. So a rajah is that wudu is nullified by touching the private part. The only stipul stipulation would be touching it without a barrier. The reason for that is what's mentioned in a narration in a hadith by Abu Huraira and Musnad Ahmad and Al-Tabarani. إِذَا أَفْضَى أَحَدُكُمْ بِيَدِهِ إِلَىٰ فَرْجِهِ لَيْسَ دُونَهَا حِجَابٍ فَقَدْ وَجَبَ الْوُضُوءِ If one touches with his hand, his private part, without a barrier, then he must make wudu. So this hadith, stipulated or required wudu when touching the private part without a barrier. This hadith alone may be weak, but combined with hadith busra, it may gain strength. However, the stipulation is actually strengthened by the linguistic meaning of touching. Just as Ibn Hazm and others said, that touching over the thobe is not really considered touching. Keep in mind this mas'ala that we went over of touching the private part. I kept repeating touching the private part. And what we mean is a male touching his penis. We'll conclude with that, inshallah. And next week we'll start with a woman touching her sexual organ. And a simple note, repeat and touching the private part instead of clearly mentioning, for example, penis over and over again. There's nothing wrong with either way. However, in honor to the class that we mentioned the name of Allah in it, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we mentioned the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the angels inshallah are surrounding us. We should choose the best of the various ways or terminology to get the point across. If it can be mentioned clearly by hinting, then that's even better. That's actually referred to as euphemism and that's actually used in the Quran. 